Thanks for the presentation and the introduction. And in this talk, I will discuss how we apply machine learning to estimate the market price of all residential properties in Spain, those 25 million, not just those that uh, are available at our portal, Idealista. But uh, first, let me provide you with some context. Um, we work for Idealista, it's the leading real estate portal in Southern Europe, and we operate in, in Spain, Italy, and Portugal. It is very similar to other real estate portals in, in the world, such as Silo in the US or uh, right Move in, in the UK. And when I talk about uh, leading the market, I am talking about leadership in terms of content and also in terms of website traffic. In fact, this map uh, is not displaying administrative boundaries. Uh, it just it is made up of ads currently displayed uh, at Idealista. And there you can see easily see uh, the shapes of uh, Portugal, Spain, and Italy. Um, but uh, let me answer this question: uh, the, uh, why we are doing this? No, um, the thing is that we are searching. Uh, for instance, when you search for an address in Spain, um, the top result that you usually get is the Alista map. Okay. Uh, for instance, in this case, we are looking for for this street, uh, Calle Velázquez 30. And this is what usually happens when you search for for a particular address. Uh, Idealista map shows in the in the first or the top result, and we are talking about uh, something like nine million addresses in the whole country. Uh, we will be talking quite a lot of, about this about this building, Calle Velázquez 30, in the presentation. So just uh, keep an eye on it. So uh, we have this huge source of traffic uh, reaching our website daily uh, because you know when you get the top results for 9 million uh, searches is uh, quite a, a large amount of, of traffic and the question here is how we could make it attractive for the visitors and provide them with some really useful information on on that location and we could start by providing data or some real estate metrics on the neighborhood uh, as it is displayed in on the left uh, panel. But the thing is that we wanted to go a little bit further and provide more granular information. And, and as we saw earlier, uh, we have lots of us and each dwelling uh, has its attributes and also its listing price. So we could estimate the, the market price of any of these apps, but the question here is that if we could estimate uh, the price for all the properties despite not having them at Idealista. And in the left panel, uh, we can see the market price estimate for all the, all the buildings near Velázquez 30. Um, but let's see how we, how we achieve the result. First, uh, we have seen why we are doing this project. Um, now let me discuss a little bit uh, how we do it. And um, you know, uh, these days, uh, we usually receive a lot of information on the magical capabilities of artificial intelligence. And um, the truth is that when you have work with data, uh, you know it's not about magic. It's all about hard work on trying to incorporate all the relevant information for, for your problem. And um, some important voices in the industry, uh, such as Andrew M, are defending this philosophy of really working on the data instead of only focusing on, on the algorithm, similar to uh, what Carto is, is doing with the, the spatial features. Um, we have been applying this approach in the past three years for this project and, and others, and now I will show you how, how we do it. Remember that our main goal is to estimate the market price for all residential properties in Spain. Um, the Spanish cadastre is a land recording of all real estate properties in the country. And it was designed for taxation purposes. And it was, an, or it has been an important tool for the Ministry of Finance since the late 18th century. But uh, as you could imagine, it is not the most suitable format for our valuation, valuation purposes. Uh, the data it provides uh, for a property is quite a scarce. Uh, it has the location with the coordinates, the address, the floor, the constructed area, um, and when it was built, uh, but nothing else. 
later on, we will go back to this information and let's see how we try to add more attributes that will help us with the with the valuation. But for now, we will focus on the on the location of the property and see what type of data we can incorporate uh, to make the the valuation more accurate. So uh, you know the old saying, location, location, location is uh, it's a topic in real estate market that try to emphasize the importance of the space around the, a property. And in this sense, we try to incorporate as much as information as possible about the surroundings of the others we are evaluating. And in this sense, we will talk about accessibility to points of interest, uh, the urban morphology, similar to what Martin has been talking uh, recently, uh, some physical attributes, and of course, information about the data on the on the population living in, in the area. And of course, uh, we will also include data on real estate metrics and information, for instance, about the price of the location, uh, the supply or the stock of properties, and also uh, our very special ingredient uh, that I will disclose later on. So let's get started with accessibility indicators or measures. Uh, we have used data available at uh, OpenStreetMap to build accessibility indicators to different services and, and amenities. In this case, we are displaying information about the, the accessibility to parks. Um, Velázquez 30 is really nearby by El Retiro, uh, one of the greatest green areas in, in Madrid. So it has a high value in this indicator. It is also really close to, for instance, uh, Recoleto's train station, and it is really close to other transportation services such as uh, metro, schools, and health facilities, not shown here. Uh, I, I don't want to show all the accessibility indicators, just a few examples. And compared to other areas in the, in the east of the city, for instance, uh, it is not so close to uh, sport facilities, which might uh, lower the price for the for the property in some cases um but now let me move on on uh, more uh, spatial attributes uh, urban morphology uh, tries to study the the spatial structure of human settlements uh, a couple of hours ago martin Friedman has presented uh, an entire workshop on this topic so i will jump directly to to our approach for instance we have created uh, this is a score that ranks the quality of the public space around buildings. And we could understand it as an approximation to other topics uh, talk here, like a walkability score or something like that. Um, for this score, we, we consider information on the width of sidewalks, the width of roads, uh, the slope of the street, and also the quality of buildings. And for our example, uh, the main entrance of Velasquez 30 has a high value in this score because sidewalks are really wide, uh, roads are not so wide, and the street is quite comfortable, it's flat, and it is surrounded by a really high quality building. Uh, another indicator that is really similar to what Martin has been doing, uh, we are also introducing as an input for our valuation model, uh, a cluster of urban areas. And we have identified uh, eight type of areas, depending on the shape of buildings, plots, blocks, and, and streets, uh, as Martin said earlier on. And, and I mean, they are clustered according to urban morphology. Um, we have reused this library mom pipe that Martin presented. Mm -hmm. uh, in this case, uh, Velasquez 30 falls into the purple class. Uh, this one corresponds to the compact block and for those of you who who know Madrid, uh, you can easily see the historical center in blue and also the old neighborhood, but also the the new extensions in in red uh, in the in the outskirts outskirts of of the city. More things we are including in in our model. Uh, another important set of factors are related to physical geography. Uh, for those cities near the coast. Uh, this implies uh, trying to measure the distance to the coast or beach or something like that. Uh, in the case of Madrid, we have also included information uh, of flood area. Uh, in this case, Velasquez 30 is really far away from, from the river. So 
So this is not a problem for, for this valuation. Um, uh, and it is indicated by the, the polygons and the, and the color, the color hexagons. Uh, as you are seeing, we are really heavy users of H3 uh, spatial grid uh, because I think it's really suitable for, for our purpose. Now let's talk a little bit about demographics. Uh, we include lots of data about demographics of people building in, in the different areas of the city where the, the properties are located. And in this sense, we include data on the population of the neighborhood, the age, and, and also the, the evolution of the, of the population. We have uh, also in-house estimates of income levels in the, in the different areas. And we also incorporate data about many other things, such as uh, education levels from, from public statistics. Uh, for instance, in, in this case, uh, Cervantes 30 in Recoletos, that's the name of the neighborhood, uh, is not a very dense area compared with other areas in the, in the city. And it has a high income population composed uh, mostly of middle aged and senior highly educated people. All these uh, attributes or features uh, impact on the on the valuation. Um, finally, uh, we can discuss also our area of expertise, uh, real estate market metrics. Uh, we have developed dozens of, of these metrics uh, that can be engineered and combined in, in hundreds when we when we transform them or or check their their evolution on, on time. One of the most popular indicators is our price index, uh, which is usually uh, applied by national authorities, such as the government and the Bank of Spain. Um, here we can see that the Recoletos 30 is a really expensive area uh, of the city, uh, uh, but uh, let me focus on, on something that few others know. Uh, in this in this time series plot, uh, we can see uh, the the visits on each app and the searches made by Idealista users. Uh, that's uh, also information for computing the, the demand and the interest of investors and buyers and renters in the different areas of the country. Um, the truth is that many competitors trying to estimate the valuation, similar to what we are doing here, uh, do some scrapping of uh, the public information at Idealista, but uh, one thing they cannot retrieve with the with the scrapping processes and the spiders and uh, that sort of stuff is that they cannot get the information on the demand side. And the truth is that these metrics are fundamental to understanding uh, when different markets of the city are getting hot or are getting cold. So uh, we have a drive through all our features that we are building in terms of spatial features, and it's our time to, to train the models. Uh, we have this huge historical database in Idealista since 2006, uh, with something like more than 3 million different ads per year. And the ads include uh, all the information you could imagine uh, on the location of the dwelling, uh, its characteristics such as the uh, the area, the number of baths and rooms, uh, amenities, and, and so on. And we all have all these spatial features that I have been presenting to you. Um, we combine this information with a uh, machine learning algorithm, and we obtain a hedonic model uh, that allow us to estimate the price of any residential property. Um, the, the thing is, you know, the, there is also this big trend in email uh, these days about the MLOx. Um, these models are automatically trained and deployed when data is updated or when we add new features. So the truth is that the models are uh, always really fresh to try to, to evaluate the, the price of any property uh, with the newest data and things like that. So uh, let's recap. Uh, we have trained our models with our features, with our spatial features and also the features coming from Idealista database. But uh, 
our starting point was the information we had in, in Cadastre. Uh, as we said earlier, this information is not complete for evaluation. Uh, for instance, on, on Cadastre, we have no information about the number of bathrooms or rooms of, of, the, of the dwelling. Um, this is really important data for our evaluation models. So uh, let me keep having this data-centric approach to the, to the problem and let's see how, how we, we can fix this, this issue. Um, to, to be able to run the inference with complete data, we are doing some data imputation process. And the process involves merging a space, a Spanish cadastre with our historical database. And uh, we had a quite a long project doing this. We did some fuzzy matching considering the addresses and the, and the dwelling attributes. So we, we could uh, match or merge uh, both databases, cadastre and, and idealista database. And um, once we have matched uh, the Spanish cadastral registry with our historical database, we create also uh, ML models for support to estimate missing attributes. For instance, in the case of uh, the flat uh, located at the fifth floor uh, right door at Cervantes 30, we estimate that it has three rooms two bathrooms and that there is also a lift in the building. It has a doorman and also that it, it has to, to pay high fee. Okay, so uh, we have done this imputation process. Um, at least we can uh, run the inference and we can estimate the market price of all residential properties in Spain. Uh, and we do that by filling our trading our train ML model with cadastral attributes, uh, the estimated attributes of, obtained through this data imputation process, and also the spatial features that we have previously built. Okay, so uh, I could show you some, some plots here about uh, our results, but the, the best thing is that you go uh, by yourself and check uh, idealista.com slash map and look for any street. Uh, for instance, uh, if you allow me, I uh, we can go there really fast. Um, and there you can see all the information at province level and you can zoom in and see the different municipalities, the district, the neighborhoods, and so on. And finally, you get the, uh, the information uh, at the building block. Um, if we look for, for our, for uh, this one, it was around here, but doesn't really matter. It's, I think it's this one, uh, yeah, uh, Velasquez 30. If we get the uh, 5D plus, we get, uh, the evaluation life of the of the model. Uh, you get the evaluation for sale and also the evaluation for for rent. Okay, and this is available also for for Italy and Portugal. Although in in Italy and Portugal uh, we don't count on on cadastre information, so uh, the information is not so rich as as it is in in Spain. But uh, you can also search for for an address there. So uh, some lessons learned uh, with this project. The truth is that uh, feature engineering is like a major topic on ML literature. And the thing that uh, I think is special feature engineering is, is even harder because you have uh, this new dimension, this space dimension that uh, with its very particular issues such as uh, the modifiable aerial unit problem and things like that. And also it impacts, as we saw yesterday in, in the talk by, by Claire, that uh, the spatial autocorrelation uh, poses new challenges when you are trying to estimate the generalized error of the models or the out of sample error. So you have to, to, to try to use this sort of a spatial cross-validation. 
uh, and you have to be aware of of these sort of problems when you are dealing with ML models that uh, try to incorporate data uh, that has this spatial autocorrelation. And also, uh, finally, the, the, there is a different set of challenges that are more related to product. Um, these are very related to how we communicate uh, the users, how our system works. Um, I think that's uh, really important that uh, we data scientists work really close with uh, product um, designers to try to explain all these sorts of, of systems. Um, there I will leave you with some really cool materials, such as the Geographic Data Science with Python book by uh, Ray Arribas Bell and, and Wolf, also the, the book by Lovelace, uh, your, co your computation with R deals with the uh, spatial cross validation topic. Um, finally, a really cool resource by Google uh, about methods and best practices for designing AI by, by Google uh, researchers. So, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I hope you have enjoyed the talk. Um, uh, you can reach me via Twitter or, or via Hopping. All right, Playa, thank you so much. That was a very insightful presentation and a beautiful deck, by the way. You have quite a lot of questions in the Q&A, and I'm not confident we'll be able to get to all of them. So if you want to check that after we do run through a couple, that would be great. There's a lot of um, positive reactions to what you just went through. But there's been quite a few about the metrics you use. So we'll start with this one by Philip in the chat. What are your accuracy metrics on that model? I cannot disclose the, the accuracy metrics, uh, but uh, I guess uh, the, the the models are quite accurate, uh, and it really depends on the on the area. Uh, for big metropolitan areas, uh, the truth is that the models work really well uh, with uh, error rates uh, below ten percent, seven percent, depending on the on the area, and they are a bit worse in in rural areas. Thanks for that. Next we have, do you run some sort of computer vision analysis on the pictures of the households to confirm if the attributes are correct, like the number of bathrooms, bedrooms, et cetera? Uh, yeah, the truth is that we extract this uh, unstructured data uh, because we have these computer vision models. Uh, but uh, here we, we use it for, for cleaning the data set, the training data set, but we cannot apply them to for the use case in particular. The truth is that we have uh, this sort of models are applied in, in many, for diff many different services in, at the Idealista. But in this, in this case, uh, as, we, as we said, uh, we are starting from Cadastre and the, the, the information the, or the input information is, is quite scarce. Awesome. And then this will be the last question that we have time for. But again, there are many in the chat and the session is recorded for anyone who wants to watch this after. But are you able to answer what data you use to validate your model outcome? Is there a data set with sales prices or anything like that? Yeah, um, we have the, yeah, the, the, the outcome of the model, we, uh, we validate it with the data on the, on the listing and also uh, that would be the the listing price, and we have to correct the listing price to to the closing price that will be in the contract of the final sales and, and things like that. And we have that sort of information that tries to accommodate uh, the predictions of the model to the reality of uh, of the transaction. Awesome! Thank you so much for taking the time to present, answer some questions, and as mentioned, feel free.